God, come to my assistance.
Dearly beloved, rejoice in the measure that you share Christ's sufferings. When his glory is revealed, you will rejoice exultantly. Happy are you when you are insulted for the sake of Christ, for then God's spirit in its glory has come to rest on you. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to all here present in Christ Jesus. This evening we gather in prayer to pray in a particular way for the Diocese of Birmingham in Alabama. And I express immense gratitude to Bishop Baker for his years of dedicated service as a true shepherd who loved the heart of Christ and his people. This evening, as I welcome all of you, I beg for your prayers for me as I'm about to embark on this new chapter in my life in the Diocese of Birmingham. I remember in a particular way my family, especially my mother Mary and brother Joseph, for their abiding encouragement and support over these many years. They are watching on EWTN tonight, and I send them my embrace of warmth and affection. Down in the South, you have to send warmth, right? We may be far away in miles, but we are close as a family in our hearts. The distance and the unusual time we are experiencing have them at home in Marquette, Michigan, in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, a very beautiful area. And I also welcome the priests, family, co-workers, and friends from the Diocese of Gaylord, from Lansing, and other places who are part of our celebration tonight. Also, the priests the religious and faithful of the Diocese of Birmingham who are here tonight. I feel a little bit like it's a getting to know you time, getting to know all about you experience. Well, it's somewhat mutual. I'm new here too. But as we contemplate where we have been and where we are going, I feel a little bit about, a little bit like a speaker I heard a few years ago at the New York Encounter. He was the architect chosen for the monumental task of completing Sagrada Familia, the famous church, now a minor basilica in Barcelona, Spain. The project to build the church began in 1882 by Francisco de Paula de Villar, the original architect. He resigned very shortly later. Antony Gaudí took over the main architect overseeing the construction of a massive church with a unique style combining Art Nouveau and Gothic features which incorporated nature and religion into the architecture. Gaudi became consumed with this project. It became his life's work. And at the time of his really untimely death, it is said that he was struck by a tram in 1926 as he was on his way to St. Philip Neri Church for his daily prayers and to go to confession. Only a quarter of the church was constructed in 44 years. The church had other problems to face because it relied on private donations. And of course, there were setbacks because of the Spanish flu in 1917 and 18, and then the Spanish Civil War in 1936 through 39. 
But during the war, insurgents broke into the crypt and in the workshop, destroying Gaudi's original designs, drawings, and plaster molds. With little money and almost no one to carry on the work and design, it slowed down to a snail's pace, the construction of this monumental church. The point of this is that in recent years, a stone cutter from Japan was passing through Barcelona in 1978 and became fascinated with the construction project. His name was Etsuro Sotu. He wasn't Christian at the time. And as he became more and more curious about the project, he expressed great interest to help out. And he was hired to continue the work of the sculptures that were necessary for the church to move toward completion. But because of lack of plans and designs which had been destroyed, he had to rely on his knowledge and imagination. As it turned out, as he struggled with the project, he, became, he came to understand that his technical expertise lacked one essential component for him to grasp the scope of what had been done, had to be done. He describes it in a simple way. So too, in his own faith journey, concluded this way. He said, I had to learn to look where Gaudi was looking. And once he could see what Gaudi was seeing, he knew and understood what had to be done. That looking, that searching, that honesty was his spiritual journey that opened him up to an ineffable presence ultimately bringing him into the faith. A good portion of our spiritual journey is precisely like that. It depends where we are looking. Where are we looking? What are we looking for? What are we hoping to see? And what are we longing for? Questions that cannot be answered by science and the accumulation of material goods, but something more. We know that somehow, in some way, we are incomplete. The masterpiece of, that God wants to build and where we are looking for that inspiration, that transcendent quality that lifts us up out of the doldrums and helps us experience the embrace of God's tender mercy and love. God helps us to put together the pieces that we can't put together ourselves. I was blind, but now I see. My brothers and sisters, during these past few months of the pandemic, we have journeyed together. We've missed our gatherings for Sunday Mass. Most often we heard from our faithful how much they treasured the reception of communion. I also heard from priests how much they valued having a physical congregation before them. And the lack of receiving Eucharist and having a congregation increased our mutual longing and yearning for the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Even so, our lives as Christians, as disciples of Christ, were never suspended. We began to hunger for that which we lack. And at times, like the Hebrews in the desert with Moses, we grumbled and complained. And all the more we heard the cry of desire and need. The Eucharist was not merely something mundane. It touched something transcendent that we know we needed and cannot live without. During this Eucharistic fast, for many, especially those identified with those in the peripheries, those who are often left out, those who are searching and struggling, those who are sick and cannot come to Mass, those who are imprisoned, those whose dignity is not respected, 
those who are paralyzed, looking for a way forward. Our gatherings are like, so too, looking for something beyond ourselves that will make us, help us make sense of the design that God is trying to build in us. As a church community, we know that God has a plan for each of us and that we share the promise and hope that we will understand one day the great design, the blueprint that God has for each of us. Christ says to us in simple words, if you want to see what God's plan is for you, then follow me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Ours is a great desire to see what was so curious to the saints, what they saw and get a glimpse of those who are pointing the way. Tonight, as we as a church commemorate two particular martyrs who were contemporaries in the late 15th and early 16th century in England, St. Thomas More and St. John Fisher, a bishop. Much could be said about their steadfast and abiding faith in troubled times. But couldn't we say they knew where they needed to look in order to maintain the conviction of their faith, especially to live their faith in the midst of the social and political upheavals of their time? Perhaps we can learn from their conviction not to become distracted by the winds of change. St. Thomas More perhaps said it best, you wouldn't abandon ship in a storm just because you couldn't control the winds. Yes, quite honestly, we face winds today. We all know it. From the recent pandemic to the more recent political and social upheavals in our city and our society. After all, don't you hear the words of Christ when the storm broke out on the Sea of Galilee and our Lord was fast asleep on a cushion. In a panic, they woke him in fear and trepidation and rebuked the winds, and immediately the winds quieted down. Why are you so afraid? He asked. Do you still have no faith? Overwhelmed with fear, they asked one another, who is this that even the winds and the sea obey? Yes, who is this? Who is this who can calm our unsettled hearts? My friends, today we embark on a new chapter for the Diocese of Birmingham with our eyes fixed on Christ. Like building Sagrada Familia, we will add to it. Yet we may never see the finished product. Sagrada Familia is scheduled to be complete in 2026. We may be subjected to winds and distractions that pull us away from our noble mission. And we may at times think that the plans have been lost or destroyed and we want to give up. We may feel our boat tossed by a storm. We wring our hands wondering what to do next. But then a light shines in the darkness, a presence that helps us see our way forward. And we can see again that with God's inspiration and help, we become the artisans again who have taken the raw materials he has provided, creating a masterpiece that we hand on to future generations to complete. We know where we need to look for that inspiration, and we must teach others to do so as well. It will give hope and meaning to our task to give us the vision. And in a time of uncertainty, we know the certainty that we long for is found not in an ideology or to the left or to the right, but an abiding and overwhelming presence that accompanies us. It is Christ.
who comes on the scene and whispers to each of us very simply, follow me. By the way, Sagrada Familia, of course, means holy family, the place where we can truly become ourselves under the pattern and model of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Through the gaze of Christ, we know we are welcomed as sisters and brothers. For us, too, it must be a place where we know we belong, part of God's great design. May it be so for all here in the Diocese of Birmingham. May God bless you all.
when the king of martyrs offered his life in the upper room and laid it down on the cross, let us thank him and say, We praise you. Let us pray. O oh God, who in the martyrdom have brought forth true faith to its highest expression, graciously grant that strengthened through the intercession of Saints John Fisher and Thomas More, we may confirm by the witness of our life the faith we profess with our lips. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Bishop Reka, on behalf of all here present tonight and all the wonderful people of this great Diocese of Birmingham, I welcome you to the Diocese of Birmingham joyfully and gratefully to the Lord and to our Holy Father. Welcome, Bishop Rekha. And I join you in thanking Archbishop Pierre, who is with us tonight representing our Holy Father, the Apostolic Nuncio, a special word of welcome to him. Thank you, Archbishop. <laughs> We thank our brother bishops for taking time to be with us, uh, all the wonderful uh, priests, deacon, religious, and laity of the Diocese of Birmingham, uh, family members, friends from Gaylord Diocese uh, who traveled all the way down here in inclement weather, as you did. Uh, we're grateful to any of our visitors and any public officials who are with us, uh, in a special way our seminarians who are uh, serving with us tonight. You have a handful of them uh, who will be uh, gratefully serving you in the days ahead. I know that uh, your transition is marked by great resilience. Uh, all of us have had to have that special virtue added to the list of virtues we live with. Uh, you in transitioning from the north to the south, which I did myself 50 years ago, uh, and I just want to say uh, it's a glorious experience 
uh, working here with the wonderful people of the South, where the numbers of Catholics are smaller, but I can say the faith is contagious and alive here. So you're inheriting uh, a great group of people who will truly love you and serve with you the Lord. And I know you bring also great experiences from your pastoral ministry as a bishop and priest, and we welcome them. I know you're part of the uh, fraternity, international fraternity of that great fraternity of communion and liberation that seeks to bring the Christian experience to society and build bridges of unity, harmony, and peace. And we know you'll bring that experience uh, to our diocese, and we're very grateful for that. <clears throat> My own personal uh, spiritual and pastoral experience in many ways with it, the Chinacolo community of Mother Elvira Petrazzi, uh, a woman who uh, worked with those who were desperate, and many of whom were addicted, and uh, her lively faith inspired me in my days of, as a priest and uh, also my time as a bishop to see hope in every desperate uh, situation if we plant ourselves firmly in Christ. And Mother Elvira once uh, told her people, she taught them uh, that they should see their lives as present, precious, a bono que tu existe. It is just simply good that you exist. And so many people in our society do not truly believe that. But she taught desperate people to believe that they are a creature of God, a loving Father, whom Jesus came to redeem. It is uh, your gift and mine, it was mine, to lead this people to be reminded how beautiful their lives are. Uh, every single life is beautiful. Every single life is precious. And that is our great gift that we bring as Catholic followers of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you in your tremendous ministry uh, that is before you in the days ahead. And may God bless you all the days of your life. The Lord be with you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
In these uncertain times, Catholics depend on EWTN's National Catholic Register. The Register is so much more than a newspaper. It's your faith, your life, your source of information and spiritual resources. Reading it faithfully enriches your walk with Christ and His Church in so many ways.